Well, for any and all who have eyes to see, I don't think it's terribly hard to see. The more the world develops, in some ways it seems to regress. There probably are many ways that as the world progresses that it regresses, but there's one that really came to mind to me today as I considered this passage here, prayed and studied over this part of God's Word. And that is that, that today we warn against things that a decade or a generation ago would have seemed so obvious, not even worth mentioning. You go through the drive through at any fast food place, you get your cup of coffee, and it says all over, warning, contents are hot. Caution, contents are hot. And, and these kind of things. We have warnings on plastic bags. You, you get a, something in the mail, and, and it's in a big plastic bag. Warning, do not place over your head. Do not use this as a toy. You buy any kind of small electronic appliance, it might be something you're supposed to use outside in the lawn, and it'll say, warning, do not immerse in the bathtub or do not put under water. Uh, all kinds of things, warnings that this or that is not a toy. Caution, caution, warning, warning. It would seem, it would seem without a warning, very, very many today would not possibly be able to discern what may or may not be a threat. And so we warn about possible threats or dangers everywhere. Now, to a generation or so, some of you will relate to this, to a generation or so who grew up on the Three Stooges or Roadrunner or Looney Tunes, who intuitively understand that bats and hammers and ladders to the face or the head, or rockets and cannonballs to the stomach, or falls from great heights with heavy objects like pianos landing on them to boot, really did do more to the body than temporarily <clears throat> blow you up and make everything look black and frizzy there from the powder burns that, that, that you then would just <clears throat> shake it off and get up and start over the next scene. All of this can seem pretty absurd. Yet across every generation, one generation after the next, it seems it comes as a huge surprise to many that the Bible, God's Word, can hurt. That the Bible, God's Word, can almost be a dangerous thing. You're carrying, to some degree, a loaded weapon. See, regular reading or irregular reading can catch one unaware and leave a mark, or worse, if you're not careful. So with this in mind, that I want to read today's text. We're in the book of Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews, I'm picking up at chapter 4, and we're reading chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
But before we consider this passage, I want us to note, there are, there are, I said that it comes as a huge surprise, the Bible can be a dangerous thing, there are very many who feel like the Bible has been used as an instrument to hurt. Very often, very many, have felt the Bible being used against them. Very many have felt judged by others with the Bible. Now, some of that judging, or some of that commentary, that one person seeks to apply the Bible to someone else's life, may actually have validity. But for centuries and centuries and centuries to the present day, some have used the Bible in hurtful ways to judge, to condemn, and to justify abusing others on everything from race to gender to particular behaviors and practices. But that's not what today is about. We're not talking about that context. Rather, what I want us to consider, the way that I want us to consider the Bible being a potentially dangerous object is to consider how the Bible, God's Word, can be something that is dangerous to us to handle. Not for our brother or sister, but for us ourselves. I want us to consider how this can hurt as we consider it for ourselves. So considering for ourselves with this passage, what do we see? Well, to start, there is a very serious warning in the very first verse, verse 12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Pretty dangerous stuff here, pretty serious warning on that, isn't it? You, that's not nearly as much as you get on a cup of coffee or even a weed eater. That, that's, that's some serious, serious stuff. Penetrating, dividing the soul, the spirits, the joints, the marrow. And then it's followed up with an equally suffering little note or qualification that comes in the next verse, verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Some serious stuff that we're dealing with today. Let's think about this a little bit. To the people of Jesus' day, to the people of Jesus' day, for centuries either way, sword was a very familiar object. It was more than a symbol to them. It was a very real threat. You're going out with your water jug to the well to bring water back to the house for the day. You're going out to the market you're going out to the market to pick some things up for the day, and a soldier or somebody walks by you, and they got a sword strapped on their side, you're paying attention to where they are and what they are doing. Today, we wrestle with issues of guns, gun control, gun violence, gun regulation, and so on. And some feel this way, and some feel that way, and there's everything in between. That's our issue. Back then, swords were the means by which one protected themselves. Swords were the means by which one sought to exert their wishes for power and domination over others. The Roman gladius, the short sword, the short sword that the Roman soldiers wore on their hip, the, the, the gladius on the hip of a Roman soldier was the equivalent of a modern policeman's sidearm. And back then there were far, far less regulations regarding the use of that weapon. But to take the reality of a blade that might maim or kill physically and apply it as a symbol to matters spiritual, that, that I hope you do see that is a powerful, powerful statement. And, and stating this sword is two-edged or describing this sword as two-edged, its nature is two-edged, emphasizes the danger. This thing can get you coming and going. This thing can get you. Watch out. What it, it doesn't matter the direction. It can get you any direction. Come and go in front, back. This is a dangerous thing. God's Word, the Bible, is a two-edged sword. But very often, we think of God's Word as a sort of a great comfort, direction, or instruction. And it can be. Most 
don't carry their Bible around or use it, worried that it might cause harm or grief, like a physical sword. We carry this around and we think of the words of comfort and inspiration that we find in it. We think of things like the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. A heart is grieving, a mind is upset because of loss. We think of the 23rd Psalm, we take comfort. We think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Love is patient and kind, etc. And we are inspired. You hear that in so many weddings. We are inspired by God's word. We read something like the beginning verses of Revelation 21. We have the picture there of what heaven will be in the end when Jesus comes again. And we have something there that gives us an incredible sense of hope. And sets our, our hearts and our imaginations on fire for what will be. We think of teachings in Scripture of Jesus as the bread of life and as the light of the world. And we have something to cling to when we find ourselves feeling weak, when we find ourselves feeling uh, at, at a loss. So many psalms help us to express our emotions. History and teaching to say nothing in the law, direct and guide and instruct us in how we ought to live and be. Letters in the New Testament give us snapshots of what the early church looked like. They teach us and instruct us about who Jesus is and they give us even more instruction about how we ought to live our lives. But hurt? Like a sword? Penetrating? Defining? Really? How, how does that work? That's not what we normally think when we think of God's Word. Well, consider the gospel lesson that you heard today, the Chris shared with us from Mark chapter 10. Here is a story. It's not a parable. It's a story. It's an encounter between Jesus and a rich young ruler. Now, this guy... He comes to Jesus. He thought he had it all together. He thought, he thought, worst case scenario, he's well on his way to getting into heaven, to eternal life. Maybe there's a little bit of fine-tuning that he could do here just to kind of put a little shine on the, the righteous life that, that, that he's leading. He comes to Jesus and he says, what do I need to do for eternal life? Truth revealed by Jesus, the Word made flesh, revealed to him that he had a foundational problem. He had a foundational problem in his faith. He had a problem with priorities. God wasn't first. He has so much of a problem, so much of a that he, he cannot reconcile the way of life that he's living with what it is that God desires, and he went away sad because he had so much. He was very rich. You think about stories uh, of, of how Jesus cuts to one's heart. There's one. Think of a couple stories where Jesus cuts to one's heart. We think about Jesus with Peter. There's a story you all know where Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Oh, well, there's uh, you know, Elijah and the whole prophets, somebody special, somebody important. Who do you say that I am? And Peter looks at him and says, You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, Yes! Well done! And Jesus goes on then and he's saying, You know, I'm going to be arrested. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And it horrifies Peter. He says, No, Lord, not you! To which Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me. Satan. Can you imagine how that stab to the heart felt? Another instance with Jesus and Peter. They're in the upper room before Jesus is arrested. And Jesus is saying, you're all going to fall away. And they're all saying, no, 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 no. Peter, the loudest of all. No, Lord, even if all of them, not me. Jesus looks at him and says, before the cock crows two times, you will deny me three times. And didn't it happen? The cock crowed twice, but Peter had already denied Jesus at 
cock crowed that second time, and he was cut to the heart when he remembered the word of God. We see this same kind of dynamic cut by the word of God in 2 Samuel when the prophet Nathan confronts David the king. David the king hadn't gone off the war like he should have. He wasn't out with his army. He wasn't out with the troops. He stayed behind. He saw a pretty woman and he gave in to lust. He pursued that passion and he took her. He took another man's wife. And then to compound the problem, he used his, his, his power, or rather he abused his power so that he could try to cover it up. He had the man killed so he could try to cover up what he did. Nathan comes to him and spins a little tale about a rich man and a poor man giving a feast with a little lamb. David exposes himself. He is exposed by the word of God that he had betrayed God. These are a couple of kind of gotcha situations that you see in scripture where the word of God cuts to someone's heart. In reality for us probably works a little bit differently. For us to consider how God's word hurts or how it might cut or how it might pierce probably the quickest way easiest way to do that is to ask some, some questions. You look for the trouble spots. You, you look for the sore spots by asking some questions. Where is it? Or what is it that you struggle with in Scripture? Or does anything make you angry or upset? Now some people may be horrified by that thought, but I've seen it. So like this, I read that and it makes me angry. Sometimes it's a righteous anger. Sometimes it's a guilty anger that comes from inside. Ask yourself that question. Is there something in Scripture that makes me upset? You might be finding a sore spot where the word is cutting into you. What makes you flinch? What makes you wince? What makes you cringe when you read it? That you really would like to get on to the next verse or the next story or the next book? that you reject anything in Scripture. Oh, we know we shouldn't. This is the Word of God. It's the whole Word of God, and I believe it is true. You've all raised your hands. You've all nodded your heads. You've all said amen to me and to many other pastors asking those questions. We know it's God's Word. We know that we shouldn't reject it, and yet, well, I told you before a couple weeks ago, Thomas Jefferson, he had an addition made up of the Gospels there, and what he did is he took out all the things he didn't agree with and just left the things that he did. Well, we probably don't go to that length. I don't know of anybody who's downloading, you get onto the internet, download the Gospels and just start whiting out or deleting out parts. And we probably don't go to that kind of length to do it. But I have heard people say, in every place that I have served, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. It's God's Word. But I'm sorry, but I just can't or I won't. I believe the Bible is true. I know it's supposed to forgive, but I just cannot forgive my brother. I know it's supposed to, but I cannot forgive my friend. I can't. Well, if you are standing there saying you believe the Bible is God's word, but you can't forgive your brother, your sister, anyone, we probably better not move on to the lesson where Jesus says that we're supposed to forgive 70 times. Seven. Some wrestle, really reject teachings on submission. That's a hard one for a lot of people. The Bible tells us a lot of places, a lot of ways that we are supposed to submit. We are supposed to submit to God. Boy, if we just did that, everything else would be easy. We would not have a problem, but we struggle. We are supposed to submit to God. We're supposed to submit to the authorities. Oh, how many of you feel like you're, you're there? You got that one down pat. Turn on the news, and then let me ask you that question again. And, you know, we're supposed to submit to the authorities. We're supposed to submit to one another, to each other. Believers in the church submitting to one another. Now, I don't believe that that means you can never say no to a brother or sister when they ask you something. But maybe we should be a lot quicker to say yes. In a lot more instances when someone in the church is asking you to do something 
we're supposed to submit to God, to authorities, to each other. For some, the thing that trips them up, they, some, they love the idea of love. Oh, I love love. Oh, we're the, we're, the, we're the people that love, and that's their identity. We're the people that love. But really, they only love those who love them. They love those who can do something for them. They love those who are like them. They don't love all their neighbors. Especially when they read that parable that Jesus taught about the Good Samaritan. And they understand that to love their neighbor means that they might have to put themselves out. And exert themselves to to, to, to do for someone else in their need when they realize that it's more than just being nice across the boundary line or like, hey neighbor over the fence like Tim the Toolman and Taylor there with Wilson. When they realize that, that that's not loving your neighbor, they oh boy, this, ah, I don't know about that. And if you struggle with the idea of loving your neighbor because it might put you out, you might need to do something, you might not even invest your time or your money or your talent. If you struggle with that, I guess we probably shouldn't worry about the whole teaching that we are supposed to love our enemies. I had a thought when I was thinking about this. You know, what would Facebook and Twitter and the newspapers and editorials and 24-hour 7 news look like if all the people who were on those platforms who say they are believers, who say they're Christians. I'm a believer. I follow God. I follow Jesus. What would those platforms look like if all those who said they're believers actually practiced this whole loving your neighbor and loving your enemy thing? I think a whole lot of the news would run out of gas. Or at least 99% of all the commentary and editorial stuff that goes on. For some, for some, the, uh, the, the, the sword that is the word that cuts them comes from Jesus' teaching, especially when Jesus teaches things that like turn the world upside down. You heard in the gospel today, Chris read at the very end, about how the first are supposed to be last. We're used to this idea. We're taught it when we're in the crib. You know, succeed, achieve, do, do, accumulate. And it's about more and more and more and more and more. But Jesus says the first will be last. He calls people to serve. He calls us to embrace living out this upside down way of thinking of living called the Beatitudes. For some, that's the thing that trips them up and cuts them. And slices, penetrates. As comforting, guiding, teaching, and affirming as God's word can be, there are many, many ways God's word can make us go ouch. Yet we must stay engaged in God's word. It's natural that something causes us pain. What do we do? We recoil. We back off. We try to get away. If you're mowing the lawn and you get stung by me, what do you do? Back the tractor up. Don't go over there. There might be more. If you're cooking in the kitchen and you touch the stove, what do you do? Pull your hand away or you, you nick your finger. Pull the knife away. It's natural. We're hurt when we experience pain that we draw away, but that's the worst thing that we can do when it comes to God's Word because you see, it is the very places that cause us to wince and to feel pain that we need to give special attention to. If we recoil from those places, we will never deal with them. We need to understand what verse 14 is telling us here. God, God is going to call us to account. God sees all. You may fool your friends. You may fool your neighbors. But you, you won't fool God. You can't hide from him. Now, here is the good news. Here is the good news. The second part of our reading today, it begins a new section in Hebrews. If you have your Bible open, it begins a new section in the book of Hebrews about Jesus. The good news is that, that it's given here, and it's immediately after this bit here, that uh, it's one of those tough teachings in the Bible. The good news is that in Jesus, we have one who relates to us. We have one who shares our experience. He knows. He understands. And he 
intervenes for us so that even if we do struggle, no, when we struggle, we will all struggle at some point or other, probably at many points, when we struggle, we may still come to God to the throne of grace. You hear me say that sometimes. This is where it comes from. When we struggle, when we fail, when we fall down, when the word of God is slicing and dicing our hearts and leaving us feeling tattered and ribbons, we still can approach the throne of grace because of Jesus. We can approach God with confidence and find mercy and grace need it. In the end, understand God's word is indispensable. All of it. What would we be without it? So I say, read it. Learn it. Meditate on it. Fill your mind. Fill your heart. Learn it. Embrace it. But two, don't take it for granted. Treat it with respect. There is power in here. Power to comfort, power to heal, power even to give life. But where we are not aligned with it, it can be painful to us. It can be cut until we are changed by it. Today and every day, may God's word live in you that you may know God's mercy and grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in your goodness and your wisdom, you gave your word so that we might know you, so that we might know what you desire, to show us how we ought to live, to assure us through your Son, Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit, it is possible for us to do so. Help us, Lord, to heed your word, all of your word. May it be our heart's desire that we seek after it always. And may it fill our hearts always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.